Welcome to this sweet and dope lecture on phylogenies. Phylogenies, you've seen them a lot, I'm sure. If you go through any scientific literature, you're going to see these trees, these representations of um, evolution, of the relatedness of species. Generally, you start here in the ancient past, um, and then they branch into um, the ends where we um, are now in modern day. So we're going to talk about phylogenies, which has its roots first in taxonomy. And we've talked about this before. Taxonomy is the naming and classifying of organisms um, and includes subsciences such as systematics, where you're looking at um, classifying organisms by their evolutionary relationships. And you may have different ways of doing that. Cladistics then is then within systematics is grouping organisms based on their shared unique characteristics. And then a phylogeny then is a evolutionary history of an or organism uh, usually represented uh, graphically. So uh, the father of taxonomy was Carol Linnaeus or Carl Linnaeus and he developed this system of using a two-part Latin name to identify a species which we call the specific epithet or the species name. So binomial means two names Nomenclature means the naming of things, so this is the nature by which we name uh, organisms. Um, so an example is the uh, cougar. The genus and species is the specific epithet. Genus is capitalized, species is underlined. And if type, it is in italics. If um, written by hand, it is underlined. So puma con color is the cougar or mountain lion. So it may go by many different common names but has one specific epithet. So Carl Linnaeus also came up with this hierarchical classification. So the way to make groups and subgroups within those groups and all organisms fit within all of these groups. Okay and it starts with our domain um, and there are three domains we'll talk about that later. Uh, kingdom, phylum, <coughs> class, order, family, genus, species. We have subdivisions even within them, but we're not going to go into those. So you have subphyla um, sometimes, or subclasses even, suborders. But for the most part, and then we also have even subspecies, but we're just going to stick to um, the basics. So uh, a taxon then is a taxonomic unit at any level. So um, order is a taxon. And the best way to, my favorite acronym for this is did Katy Perry come over for good spaghetti? And if you click on this uh, YouTube video, it will take you to a song of Katy Perry singing where the words uh, mom's spaghetti is inserted randomly. Um, so it's a great way to refresh your memory on the uh, different taxa in hierarchical classification. All right, so I said we were going to talk about phylogenetic tree or phylogeny. This is a branching diagram representing the evolutionary relationships between different organisms. Mostly it matches the hierarchical classification, but we sometimes do have a mismatch which occurs because of derived traits or new traits. Um, DNA similarities, similarities have also caused us to regroup and reclassify species. This is an example of baleen whales, um, which I did some research on. I didn't do this specific one. Um, but some things are still questionable. Um, so example, for example, where, where the... Um, uh, Caprera marginata fits within relation to other species or the gray whale also. Here it's um, out further in relationship to the other species sometimes it's put in with the others. Um, so these are still up to debate which is why we consider phylogenies as a hypothesis or um, an estimate of how we think the relationship is based on the data we have. 
it's generally depicted as a series of dichotomies, right? Where you have one um, taxa or diverging into multiple, one ancestral species diverging into separate taxa. Each branch, branch point or node represents the divergence from a common ancestor. And sister taxa then are on the ends, or which are groups that share an immediate common ancestor. So the node and all of its taxa from the node are six sister taxa. Basal taxa represent groups that diverge early in evolutionary history. Okay, so this would be a basal group to this group. And a polytomy is a branch where relationships is still unclear, so it's um, shown as more than two diverging from one. All right, so on here, this is a an actual phylogeny from a um, publication done by Sasaki et al. in 2005. And you can see all the different things we just talked about. You've got branch points. There's one there. There's lots of different branch points. You've got sister taxa. Here's some sister taxa here. Um, that would not be sister taxa, right? Because they are not um, together. You see these nodes which separate them. Um, these are also not, uh, oh, these would be basal taxa, right? So it's kind of outside the rest of this group. And then uh, there is a polytomy here as well. You can see right here, the relationship between these four groups is not understood. So it's written as a polytomy. So constructing a phylogeny can be done using lots of different characters. You can look at morphological and molecular um, homologies. Um, homologies are characters that are similar due to shared ancestry. Um, homoplasies are similar characters due to conversion evolution. Right? Um, so carrying of the young, what both whales and this black widow spider may do, but that would be a homoplasy, um, not a homology. All right, so then here is a clade which is a representation of a group of uh, an ancestral species and all its descendants. Okay, so we have an ancestral species here, all its descendants that we know of. And there are different types of groupings or clades. Um, a monophyletic grouping includes an ancestral species and all its descendants. So in purple here, all of these, including back here to the ancestral um, species, this would be a monophyletic group. Paraphyletic uh, includes some but not all of the ancestors. So if this ancestor again is our reference point, oh, it's a different one, but uh, and we just talk about these as dinosaurs, okay, but we don't include the birds, then that's a paraphyletic group because it doesn't include the ancestor um, of the birds. And then lastly, you have a polyphyletic grouping, um, which includes taxa with different ancestors. So a reptile, right? You would, um, well, reptile would be paraphyletic. But a flying vertebrate then, a bat and a hawk are both flying vertebrates, but they are not related, um, directly related. Okay, so that'd be a polyphyletic grouping. All right, so another example here. Um, what type of grouping would this be? What type of clade? This would be a monophyletic grouping. This one, because it doesn't include birds, but includes the ancestor diapsids and all the other ones, this would be a paraphyletic grouping. So shared derived traits then are used to uh, construct phylogenies. Um, by derived, I mean unique, something that has evolved that wasn't um, a part of the ancestral characters. A shared ancestral character then 
is a trait that originated with an ancestor of the taxon. So it is shared throughout the um, group except for any derived characters. So those then are used, derived and ancestral characters, to determine relationships. Um, in constructing a phylogeny, then an outgroup is used for comparison. So here we have um, a bunch of vertebrates that have the amniotic membrane, so they're all grouped together. And we use a salamander as a outgroup to um, determine the relationship. The in-group is the taxon being studied, so here's our in-group amniotic vertebrates. And what we can do is uh, assume that any differences between this ancestral and um, ancestral species and the in-group um, is shared um, because of relationship. Okay, so if a lizard has more um, shared characters with a salamander, we assume that it is more related to the salamander than the rest. And then the, this has more and more derived traits, such as hair. So hair is the derived traits. All of these have it. Um, the lizard does not have hair, so, and neither does the salamander. So that would be the ancestral trait. All right, tail loss. Anyway, go on from there. All right, so you can come with, come up with all different types of phylogenies, all different types of hypotheses. But generally, the one that is simplest is considered to be the most correct. And we're following the principle called Occam's razor, where the simplest is usually the most correct one. And in uh, phylogenies, we call this the principle of maximum parsimony. So we're trying to find the um, phylogeny that has the least number of evolutionary events taking place. All right, so just as a very simple example, if you looked at um, these blue this blue species of hummingbird and two red species, it's more likely that those red feathers evolved once in an ancestral species, and that's why both of them are red, than uh, if they both um, evolved the red trait independently. All right, so again, some of the relationships between vertebrates uh, is done using these these same principles of maximum parse, parsimony. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the universal phylogeny. So some history on this. Originally, Linnaeus came up with two kingdoms called plants and animals and classified everything into those two. But he couldn't see bacteria. He couldn't see really small things. So with the microbiotic discovery, with the implementation of microscopes, we're able to see a lot more life forms. Uh, and so we had to split our thinking into different kingdoms. We also have the classification of fungi, which aren't plants. Um, they're actually more closely related to animals. Um, and so in the 1960s, we came up with this five kingdoms idea. And then uh, that lasted for a while. Through the 80s, we added uh, there was a question about protists and monera. So monera is where bacteria was kind of all thrown into there. Um, and they realized that these protists had relationships with different, you know, there were fungal-like protists, there were animal-like protists, there were plant-like protists, so it didn't fit very well as five different kingdoms. But now we have um, resolution through molecular sequence data and other um, characters. Um, and have come up with the most basic grouping of organisms is the three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And sometimes said eubacteria, eucarya, and eukarya. So this is a, a representation then of what our um, ancestral, most ancestral phylogeny and universal phylo phylogeny looks like. Eubacteria um, um, are what we refer to as most bacterial uh, species. Then we have archaea bacteria, bacteria, and finally eukarya, which are eukaryotes. So represented in a little bit different phylogeny, you have um, 
a ancestor to Archaea. That is, um, or the common thinking is that Archaea and Eukarya are more closely related than bacteria. So bacteria would be the outgroup from these two. Um, but there is also evidence that a symbiotic relationship occurred between a bacterial and archaean organisms to make the first eukaryote. So suggesting that there was a ring of life rather than three uh, tree domains. Okay, that's it for phylogenies.